Dr. Bertrand Picard is chairman of the Solar Impulse Foundation and one of our, our great explorers, the first man to fly around the world in a balloon and in the solar airplane as well, and one of the great ambassadors for clean technology. Dr. Picard, it's, it's so nice to meet you and to have you on the Climate Pod. I'm very happy to join you. So many interesting topics today to tell about preparing COP26, climate change, inclusion of the economy, the industry's task to bring new solutions. So I was looking forward to have this conversation with you. Well, let's start. Let's go all the way back to the beginning, though. What inspires you to want to work on this? You know, what is it about driving innovation to combat climate change that appeals to you? You know, to be really precise, it's not a question of innovation because innovation is always linked to the future. People who want to promote innovation are people who want to bring solutions for the future, but we already have solutions today. So what I would like to bring is more the common sense of using the efficient technologies today. That means maybe the innovation of yesterday and the innovation of yesterday, who has brought a lot of good solutions for today, are not used. So what do we see today? We see a world that is wasting three quarters of the energy that is produced, half of the food, wasting half of the natural resources because we don't have a circular economy. And we're even wasting 95% of the waste because we're not understanding that waste is a resource. So basically what I want to do is to bring solutions to make the world more efficient. What do you see in 2021 as some of the biggest challenges to that innovation? The biggest challenge is to bring innovation, bring technology to the market. Because I hope I will not disappoint you too much about not speaking so much about innovation, but you know, we have the solutions today. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of processes, systems, products, materials, devices, sources of energy, and they can solve a lot of problems in the field of water, construction, mobility, agriculture, industry, energy. And we, we're not saying this at the Solar Impulse Foundation as a wishful thinking. We are saying that there are a lot of these solutions available because we went looking for them everywhere in the world, in startups, medium-sized companies, big corporations on every continent. And we came up with 1,300 of them, 1,300 of them, which are protecting the environment, but at the same time allowing to create jobs, allowing for the economy to run, allowing for the social protection to be paid, uh, allowing for new business opportunities. And this is really important. This is why I, I always make a, a difference between the solutions that are available today to be cleaner, more efficient, reduce the waste and reduce pollution, and innovation, which is taking a lot of time before the solutions come on the market. So, you, you know, I've noticed that if you want to be applauded in a speech, you have to say, I am in favor of innovation. <laughs> and then everybody applauds. But what does it mean, honestly? It means that we don't have solutions today, that we need to run innovation in order to find solutions in the future. But it's a wrong message. It's a wrong message. Innovation is not for the politicians. Innovation is for the research labs. What, what we need from the politicians is to put the, the legal framework in place in order for the people to be obliged to use the cleanest ways, the cleanest technologies that are available today. And, and, and this is really the obstacle we're facing. Thousands of technologies everywhere, thousands of solutions everywhere, but people don't use them. So we're talking a few weeks before COP26, so this will air during COP26. So at, at, at this moment, you know, we'll have world leaders talking at COP26 about exactly these topics. How do, how do they work to provide the legal framework, as you mentioned, to foster greater innovation? 
So when you think about all these world leaders coming together to have these kinds of conversations, especially on on science and technology, um, what do you want to see world leaders accomplish this year to help us drive that forward and actually use the solutions we have today to fight the, the climate crisis? I'm expecting from them, or I'm hoping from them, <laughs> to bring very ambitious NDCs, the national determined contributions. That means the commitment from every country. And how can we get that? First, we have to understand what is their language. Their language, their worries, their program for the politicians is about creating jobs. If they create unemployment, they are kicked out. They're not re-elected. And for the industry, it's about profit. It's about creating purchase power for, the, for, for, for society. It's about making profit that goes into the investment of the pension funds, life insurance, social security, and so on. So if you go to these people and you say, we have to protect the environment, we have to fight climate change, but it's going to be difficult it's going to be expensive. You will need to make a lot of sacrifice. You will, you will need to renounce to big fields of your industry. It will never work. It will never work. They will resist. They will delay the, the answers. And it will be like in the last 20 years where we're expecting from them bold actions that they do not take. So what I would like to do at COP26 and what I... I'm really urging the people to do is to, is to speak about the economical benefits, the new business opportunities, the new opportunities for job creation that will happen if we bring our world to be cleaner, to be more efficient, to save natural resources, to get into the circular economy, thanks to new technologies. But new technologies, the technologies of today, I would, I would rather say modern technologies rather than new technologies, because it gives the impression new, it doesn't exist. No, modern technologies that exist, like the one that we have identified at the Solar Impulse Foundation. And if we show the advantage of using these technologies, using these solutions, if we show the advantage of fixing climate change as a business opportunity, all these world leaders can be really motivated. They can be, they can be really excited because it will put the ecology as the driving force of the economy. And I think we will, yeah, we, we will allow them to commit to much bolder actions. Well, it's very clear to me that not only do you know a lot about clean energy technology, but with your background in psychiatry, you really understand human behavior as well. And this messages that you're talking about that resonate with people, I have to imagine you understand why it resonates better with people than, than maybe I would. And I'm curious when you think, because you know, these politicians, they, they, can, um, they can certainly put things in order to have a successful, more sustainable economy. But obviously you need buy-in with constituents as well, you need we need to have everyone bought in to the sort of clean energy, sustainable economy that we need. So when you think about it from just a human behavior standpoint, the message you're talking about, the economic benefits using technologies we have today, why do you think that message will resonate with the everyday person? Because the everyday person also has an advantage to be using more efficient systems. If you live in a house that is badly insulated, you pay a very big energy bill. If it's well insulated, you save money. If you go into buying more quality products that last for longer, you save money. All these waste that we are producing that destroy the environment, they destroy the economy also because the companies have to sell a lot at a very low price with a very small margin of profit, and it's not good for the economy either. So what I am promoting now is what I call the qualitative economical growth. It's an economical growth that is not based on the quantity of the production, on the quantity of the consumption, on the quantity of the waste, no. 
It's a qualitative economical growth that is based on the quality of the efficiency. That means that you can create jobs and make money by replacing what is polluting by what is protecting the environment. And I think it's a win-win-win. It's a win for the industry, for the politic, for the environment, but it's also a win for the consumer because for him, he has better quality and it, he, he has to pay less at, at the end. So you see, it is a way to avoid this dilemma that makes us prisoners. Today, we, we are required to choose between degrowth, that means less economical functioning, less economical activity, and this will lead, I believe, to a lot of suffering for the poor people. It's, uh, it's, it will make a social chaos. But the other alternative, we cannot accept it either because this is the so-called illimited growth, the crazy things we're doing now with more consumption, more production, more waste, more pollution, and more climate change. And this leads to an ecological disaster. So I think we have to refuse both. Both don't lead anywhere. We need this third path, which is the qualitative growth, where we can at the same time have the economy working, but in a way that we protect the environment by replacing what is polluting by what is clean and, and efficient. And basically, you know what? To achieve that, we have to replace everything. <laughs> we have to replace the combustion engines, the old industrial processes. We have to go for fossil, uh, we, we, we have to go for renewable energies and stop with fossil fuel pollution. And all this is the market opportunity of the century. Can you imagine? Today, the renewable energies are cheaper than oil, gas, and coal in most parts of the world. You have solar energy at 1.5 cents per kilowatt hour. If you produce electricity with gas, oil, or coal, you are four times more expensive. And now you see these days, you have this huge increase in the price of gas and oil. But this is normal. It's normal. It's things that the ecologists were saying since 20 years. Fossil energies are going to be out of price, so much expensive. So we have to go on renewables because the price of renewable can only go down. The price of oil can only go up. So you don't need to be a green activist to understand that. You can also be an economist, an investor, a head of state, and you can modernize the infrastructures. You can diversify in new, in new business opportunities. And this is really the message that we have to bring at COP26. It's also about running the economy in a better way, not only about fixing climate change. And if we speak this language, I believe the negotiators will be much keener to accept ambitious NDCs. The heads of states will say, okay, it's an advantage for us. And it's, we do not create so much resistance if we have this economical language at the same time than the ecological language. Yes, yeah, it's, it's kind of um, incredible timing that we have this energy shortage going on weeks, the, the we in the weeks leading up to COP26. What impact do you think that might have on the conference? I hope people will understand that there is the world of the past and there is the world of today and we can create the world of the future and we have to choose right now, not wait too long. Because we, you know, even for investors, oil is a very dangerous investment. It's a stranded asset. Because if you are a pension fund, you're a life insurance, you cannot think about the short term because the long term will destroy you. You have shares from oil companies and if these oil companies do not diversify into hydrogen, renewable electricity, um, biogas, uh, and things like that, the shares will go really down. Huh? And you can divide by two, by, by three, by four, the value of the shares of oil companies in 10 years, 15 years, because people will not use as much oil. 
And this will be like the subprime crisis in 2008. Suddenly, all the investors say, wow, these are stranded assets. I have to sell them and be the first to sell them. And then everybody sells, and you have a financial crash at the stock exchange market. You know, this is why the ecological crisis is linked to the economy. And the only way to keep the economy alive is to be ecological. It is to fight climate change. It is to go for the modern technologies. It is, it is to go for the renewable energies. You know, I think in I'm, I'm in the United States and the United States, but all around the world, there's quite a lot of buzz around for prominent venture capitalists, um, even entrepreneurs talking now about wanting to tackle climate change, bringing a lot of energy into this discussion. Um, you know, as, as I know, you know, a lot of that is a lot of that talk is around innovation, which I'm glad we get, we talked about, about that. But I think that you are seeing, at least anecdotally, a sort of step change in the way people talk about climate change as a problem that needs to be solved and, and addressed. Are you seeing a kind of change in the amount of attention you're seeing and hearing when you talk to investors and entrepreneurs about the need to tackle climate change? Yes. Yes, and I'm going to tell you why. If investors are putting money in bonds, the interest rate is zero. If they put it in shares at the stock exchange market, it's quite dangerous. Right now it goes up, but it's quite irregular. If they go on private equity, very often they pay the companies too much, too expensive, because people all want private equity. Same for real estate. You buy the buildings for a price that is too high, so the profitability goes down. What's left? What's left? Well, investment in all the new modern infrastructures, the investment in the startups uh, with VCs, because these startups are going to bring what the world needs. Uh, we have identified so many of these startups in the 1,000 plus solutions at the Solar Impulse Foundation. Um, and uh, we have decided to create two investment funds to help these startups to develop. One investment fund with BNP Paribas and the other one with uh, Rothschild, Five Arrows. And uh, we are supporting or bringing money for these companies, for these startups to grow and to bring to the world the beautiful products that they already have, but that people don't know about. So it's a huge potential of development, huge potential of development. Now, other very interesting things are the green bonds because green bonds are giving much more interest rate and profit than the normal bonds of polluting uh, systems. And uh, this is interesting. You can create a lot of uh, renewable energy infrastructures. Uh, you can insulate buildings. You can make the investments, the, the forefront investments for electric mobility for public transport. You go into electrolyzers and hydrogen. You know, these are fantastic fantastic business opportunities for the investors. And at the same time, they protect the environment. You know, with 1300 solutions identified, I can't imagine you're, you know, it, it, it's gotta be hard for you to, to be able to choose where you see some of the biggest opportunities to leverage technology to make the greatest impact. But I'm curious, what are some of the biggest areas you think will see change the fastest when it comes to leveraging these technologies? Everything that saves natural resources. In the field of water, there are systems to detect the leaks in the public system of water. Incredible loss of water, 50% of the water usually in the city is lost by the leaks. So you have systems that detect the leaks. You have systems that are allowed to recycle the water, to purify the water, to desalinate the water. All this on renewable sources of energy. So if you really implement all these systems, uh, the, the water is, is not an issue anymore. You're going to, to have enough because you save it. Even in agriculture, you have now some seeds that are uh, dressed in a type of molecule that keeps the water around the seed. So you don't need to put so much water for agriculture. Now for, for energy, really interesting energy, because there are much more sources of energy than we think. 
You know, for example, you all know the big wind turbines, okay? But you can have small horizontal wind turbines on the edge of all the buildings because there is a, a current of air that is always lifting against the facade and you can produce electricity. It is silent and, and it is cheap. Now, for solar, it's the same. Uh, wind, uh, yeah, I talked about wind. Um, you have a lot with hydroelectricity. You can put little tur turbines into the, the, the water pipes in, in the houses, in the buildings. You can put little water turbines uh, into rivers. You can use the power of the tide, the power of the wave, the power of the currents, the power of the little rivers. Uh, it's, it's exactly the same with biomass. So much biomass everywhere that can be turned into methane. Now, there is a very promising thing also for aviation. You take the CO2 from the chimneys of the factories, you combine it with hydrogen that is produced by electrolyzers with solar energy, and you can rebuild kerosene chains, uh, hydrocarbons chains, like, like the kerosene. And it is carbon neutral because you took CO2 and you give back CO2, so it's carbon neutral. It is still a bit expensive now. This is not something that will be available before a few years. So this is more innovation than modern technology that is usable today because of the, of the cost. But everything else is absolutely, absolutely profitable. So, you, you know, when I speak like this, I know that some people listening to us are going to say, yes, okay, renewable energies, yes, it exists, but we can never produce enough for the needs of the world. Wrong, completely wrong. Because the needs of the world today is two or three times too much because of the inefficiency of the system. We lose three quarters of the energy that is produced. Even in a thermal engine, the efficiency is below 27%. So three quarters of the energy in your tank is lost. So in parallel to the development of renewable energy, you have to decrease the energy consumption by, by introducing efficiency just efficiency measures and in the the 1300 solutions we have identified a lot of solutions are also to reduce the waste in the energy consumption and here i give you a little example i love you you can recover the heat from the chimney of a factory to give it back to the factory instead of having this heat lost in the chimney like it has been in the last 200 years. People see smoke, but they don't see its heat also. So they recover the heat. Um, there are systems everywhere like this to be much more efficient. And all the new insulation systems for buildings, all the new industrial processes, all the new electric motors for the industry. You know, one third of the electricity in the world is used for electric engines in the factories. And the new electric engines are 60% more efficient. Wow. So, so you see, all this is, it's, it's a business opportunity for the industry. It's new jobs created in every country. And this must be a stimulation, a big incentive for the people to do it. Because even if there was no climate change, it would be logical as much as ecological to do it because it's profitable. And I think this just goes back to what we were talking about earlier in the conversations. How do you get these technologies to market and how do you get them these technologies widely adopted? You gave a great TED talk recently when you were saying that you know many valuable tools in the in the climate to combat climate change are just not well known and then therefore not used. So how do we change that? How do we allow more lawmakers, entrepreneurs, investors, consumers to understand that these technologies exist so that they are widely adopted? Yes. Um, the pioneers understand it and use it. And you have companies, energy companies like NG, for example, what do they do? They invest at the place of the client to reduce the energy consumption of the client, and they save, uh, sorry, they share the profit that is made by the saving. So you see, it's a pioneering business model 
where they make more money when they sell less electricity. But there are not a lot of companies who are doing that. So your question is very, very relevant. How do we go from the world of the past to the world that is modern with new processes? And one thing that we have to observe is that the regulations, the legal framework today is as outdated as the systems we still use, which means that it is allowed to use old and polluting systems and it is legal to pollute. It is legal today to put as much CO2 as you want in the atmosphere, as much plastic in the oceans, as much chemical in the water and in the soil. And this has to change because as long as the people who are accused of pollution can answer what I do is legal, I have no reason to change, nothing will change. So we need the governments today to modernize the legal framework to put the standards, the norms, at a much tougher level, much more demanding, to create a need, a necessity for these solutions to come on the market. Because if suddenly you cut by 80% the allowance for toxic particles emitted by gasoline cars, what will happen? It will happen that everybody is going to buy the systems that allow a thermal engine in a car to produce 80% less toxic particles. And this system exists. It has been labeled at the Solar Impulse Foundation. It's a French uh, startup. But nobody buys this system as long as it is allowed to produce 100% of the toxic particles. But when it will be allowance only for 20%, everybody will buy the system. And it will be new jobs. It will be a startups that will grow, that will spread its product everywhere. And it protects the environment. Because even if you have a lot of electric cars coming on the market, there are still 2 billion thermal engines that remain in circulation. And you need to do something about it to reduce pollution in the cities. So, so you see, at the end, we need the governments to act for pollution, for the economy, for the climate, for the efficiency, for the well-being of people, because the solutions exist and it is profitable. So, so they can do it. And today we have a constellation of stars that are aligned and allowed to act, which was not the case 10 years ago when the solutions either did not exist or were too expensive. Today, solutions exist. They are profitable. They are not known enough, but this is our task to make them known, to promote them, especially at COP26. We need to show it to everyone. And then it's the duty of the public authorities to create this need with the legal framework to, to have them been introduced and implemented on the market. Well, I think someone, as someone who talks about the climate crisis a lot, I think one of the things I think about is how do you not only accelerate those solutions, those profitable solutions, but how do we make sure they're accelerated across, across the globe, right? So that they are adopted in a way that doesn't just drive more inequality in the global environment. When you think about what world leaders can do to make sure that we're fostering the adoption of those technologies everywhere, what can they do to make sure that as we start to make, we start, as we start to apply these solutions, we're not just driving more inequality? You are absolutely right to bring the question of inequalities on the table. And today, there are a lot of inequalities because the energy is expensive and it's also difficult to transport. And for poor countries, the poorest countries, they need to pay the energy with foreign currencies, mm -hmm. with dollars, and not in the local currency. So what's, what's the result? They have to import energy. They are exporting foreign currencies, and they are getting poorer and poorer every day. If these countries receive investments, profitable investments, to create renewable energies locally, off the grid, 
they are going to become much more uh, developed in terms of economy. You can put solar panels, irrigation pumps, batteries, uh, plugs for the telephone, lighting for the children in the school. You create a local development. You create local wealth. And you jump, you leapfrog over the development of power lines because you don't need power lines anymore if you have local production of energy. You don't need pipelines. You don't need trucks to bring all the gasoline uh, in the remote areas. You don't need the diesel generators that are so expensive. No, you create local development. And I believe that renewable energies is the, is the best way, if not the only way, to create social stability, to create peace, to create wealth, development, jobs, and to fight against poverty. We're going to fight against poverty like this. So fixing climate change in the way of using the clean and efficient technologies is socially mandatory also. And it allows to make one more star in the alignment because everything is linked together. Oh, absolutely. And we're seeing in this current pandemic and, and the way you know we're still amid the pandemic trying to um, have an economic recovery that actually addresses those things. You hear a lot, and obviously in the United States, we hear a lot of build back better, but you hear that in Europe as, as well. And I think that we are in a opportunity where we can have those stars aligned to actually have, to actually kind of foster the growth that we need and to accelerate the pace at which we're actually addressing the crisis. What do you think should be accomplished in this particular moment in economic recovery that can accelerate the change we need? We need to get the climate change issues a little bit outside of the political cleavage. Because today, in a lot of countries, if you are more on the left, you want to act on climate. If you are more on the right, you start to deny climate change or you think, oh, it will solve by itself. And then you have the ecologists who come, the, the green activists who say, oh, we have to degrow. We have to s slow down the economy. And then you have the industry who says, no, not at all. We have to do much more business. Otherwise, the economical system will collapse. And it makes a big fight between a lot of people. And then you have the one who say, oh, but climate change, this is for 50 years. So we shouldn't change our behavior today. And it makes a fifth actor that doesn't want, let's say that is slowing down the process. So I believe that we have to think in a very rational way, very realistic, realistic way. What do we want to achieve that will please everybody, every actor. We will please the green activist by reducing pollution, by fixing climate change. We can fulfill the wish of the right wing in the politic, who don't care about climate change, by explaining and proving that it is more profitable, that it will create more jobs. And then the industry is going to say, OK, great, we can diversify and take new business opportunities. And we're going to make more profit. And the people who say, yes, but climate change is in a long time, well, they will see that even today, there will be less pollution. There will be less suffering, less health problems, less inequalities. So you can, you have to de-zoom, you know, because people are too much on their own field, take some altitude and change altitude, like in the balloon, huh? you drop ballast, you drop the certitudes, you drop the old ways of thinking, the old habits, drop the ballast, change altitude, and the winds of life will take you in another direction. And we have to reconcile economy, ecology, politic, long and short term views, industrial needs, we can reconcile it. We can reconcile because the solutions exist, they are profitable, and they are ecological. What do you think is the barrier for most people that are resistant 
to that kind of change that seems like a win-win for everyone. Yes, you know, people hate to change. And huh? here I speak more as a psychiatrist and psychotherapist as, as an explorer. Um, people hate to change. There are two things that make people change. It's a huge crisis that really frightens them or it's personal advantage. So the huge crisis is coming, but only half of the world is seeing it. For the other half, the, the advantage to change should be the business opportunity, should be more profit, more job creation, which means that even if there was no climate change, even if there was no pollution problems, they would have an incentive to change. But today, they have not understood well enough that it is profitable. You still have old myth, old legends, you know? Solar and wind is intermittent. You don't have it all the time, so it's not reliable. But people forget that now we have the storage capabilities, the storage technologies that exist. You can have two lakes with a dam. And when you have enough wind and solar energy, you pump the water up to the upper lake. And when you need the electricity, you put the water down through the turbine and produce electricity. You can produce the same amount of electricity as a nuclear power plant in a dam for several hours. So you can be a buffer for the grid with the renewable energies. But people don't know it. There are enough places in the world to store 100 times the amount of inter intermittent solar energy that you need for all humankind. But of course, we have to build them. We have to construct them. And this is jobs, and this is profit for, for everyone. So if we don't understand that, if we don't tell it, if there are not enough podcasts like yours that are really informing the key decision makers, we will not move. We'll have complacency. We'll have people who are lazy, people who, who will say, oh, we have time, we'll change later. So what we see is that the pioneers today are changing, changing things, using new technologies. The activists are really pushing, they're doing their jobs. Now, what we need are the governments to take the measures in order to be the real engine, the really driving force to change this old way of doing into modern ways of doing. And I'm sorry to say that, but even if it is obvious, you need sometimes to give a kick in the ass of the people to make them move because they, they don't move. They, they are afraid, they are lazy, whatever. So sometimes there is something that has to push them and uh, the incentive, I think, can be the, the legal framework, can be a carbon tax, can be whatever, but we need now to go on to more efficiency of resource, efficiency of energy, efficiency in the processes, circular economy. And uh, basically, you know, we really need to decouple the GDP from the quantity of the consumption to link it to the quality of the efficiency and the modern technologies. Uh, and we need to, to say it for a long time. You know, it took, it took about 40 years for people to understand that they would have lung cancers if they are mm -hmm. smoking cigarettes. And despite the knowledge that it is dangerous to smoke, you still have people who smoke. So it's the same for fossil energies. It's the same for the production of waste, for the production of CO2 and all that. It takes, it takes time and we don't have time because the situation is really urgent. Well, I think you know, we're, we're fortunate enough to talk on the show to talk to policymakers around the world who do understand the problem, who are wanting to learn more about the problem and can understand the need to measure quality over just quantity. And I find in the United States that when we talk to policymakers, a lot of times, oftentimes, they're newer to politics, frankly. And I think I, one of the things that I keep going back to on this show is how do we scale that level of knowledge? People can understand job benefits, environmental benefits, the, the, the benefits 
of moving on climate. It's just, I think, one of the, the knowledge gap that exists for many policymakers on how to actually leverage these technologies, implement them, and make those changes. I think for a lot of people, there's just a little bit of fear that they don't know all of the things that they should know. Now, when you get to COP26, you have a lot of people who are going to have a deep well of knowledge. But when you think about what those policymakers can go, when they go back to their respective countries and they're they're trying to meet these nationally determined, determined contributions, how do you get more informed policymakers across the board so making these arguments is just easier? Yes. You know, maybe it will not work. Maybe it will not work. Maybe all the solutions exist, they are profitable and they will not be used and we will continue to increase the gap between what we do and what should be done. And we will have a miserable quality of life in the future and an increase of sea rise, of temperature, of natural disasters, of inequalities, of tropical sicknesses in the... Uh, cold countries because they become too warm, maybe we will fail. And, and this is an option. Uh, usually we say failure is not an option. Well, in this case, maybe failure is an option because we will not do what we need to do. And it's, it's horrible. It's exactly like a story I heard, you know, off the coast of Brazil, there is a boat that sunk. And the sailors got on a rescue uh, life raft and they waited for rescue that did not come. And they were just off the place where the Amazonian river is coming in the sea. And all these people died from thirst, but they never tested the water below them. It was fresh water. It was not salt water. So they thought they were in the middle of the sea. It was salt water. They couldn't drink it. But it was actually the fresh water coming from the Amazonian river that was coming inside the sea. It was a big bubble of fresh water. They died of thirst above fresh water. Can you imagine that? We might have the climate crisis increase, the pollution increase, the inequalities increase, although we have all the solutions available. And this is really sad. And this is why we need to ring the bell. This is why we need to inform. This is why we really need to work all together. And this is something I would like to emphasize. Very often, we attack the people who are polluting. And we reinforce their resistance instead of helping them to diversify. You know, I, I was once with a president of a country that is using a lot of coal. And he told me, I cannot renounce of coal. It's the entire economy. I told him, let coal on the side. Let's not speak of coal. Let's speak about energy efficiency in order to reduce the need for energy, in order to use the startups of your country to bring the solutions to the market. You don't speak about coal, but you speak about modernizing all your infrastructures. And you can be the cleanest country of the world, although you have the coal still because you're so much more efficient than others. And he looked at me and said, oh, the way you're presenting it is very attractive. Yes, I would like to work and know more about all these technologies that my country could use. I think this is what we need. We need this cooperation, this collaboration, this synergy between the one who are afraid of changing and the solutions that can help them to change. You know. I can imagine that policymakers around the globe want to talk to you, not only because you have this great message, you really understand clean technology, but you're also one of the great explorers in the world. And I, you know, reading up on, on your background, the fact that you flew in the solar powered airplane, let's, let's, first of all, let's just start there. What was that experience like? It was magical to fly with no fuel no noise, no pollution, and to be able to stay airborne longer than any other airplane that is using gasoline. This is magical. And you know, I, I launched this project in order to prove that clean technologies and renewable energies could achieve impossible goals. So of course, 
a lot of people were skeptical and they told me it's impossible. And even the airplane industries told me it was impossible. And when I achieved it, it was once more the proof that pioneering spirit has no limit. With pioneering spirit, you can invent so many new things. So, so you imagine you are in this experimental airplane and you think there is only one of a kind. I'm flying it and the rest of the world is still polluting. It came to my mind that I was not in the future. I was just in the present because it's what the current technology has allowed me to do at this moment. But I had like the revelation that the rest of the world was so much in the past that the rest of the world could be doing exactly what I was doing. And, and that was a shock. This is really the moment I understood that we basically have to replace everything that we're using today because everything is inefficient and everything is polluting and everything is too expensive because of the waste and the inefficiency. So Solar Impulse was a fantastic experience for a pilot, for an explorer, but also for an environmentalist like me. And of course, you know, once I overflew a tanker, I was above the Atlantic Ocean, there was an oil tanker, and there was a big trail of oil behind him. And I was flying above him with solar power. And I thought, how can we have so much contrast, so much old ways of doing, when the future is completely open with technologies we already have today to do things? such in a different way. You know, I was listening to another interview you, you gave, we were talking about the, the incredible exploration that your father and your grandfather were able to accomplish. And when I, a guy got back to, what you got back to in those conversations was the idea of purpose and doing things that are meaningful, not just that are, are innovative and, and great accomplishments to make history, but things that matter and are meaningful. Why is that something that has guided many of the things you've accomplished in your career? I think it's the examples I had from my grandfather and my father. When my grandfather in 1931 made the first ever flight to the stratosphere, being actually the first man to see the curvature of the earth with his own eyes, what was his purpose? One purpose, one purpose was to study cosmic rays, but the other purpose was to show that it was possible to fly above the bad weather in very high altitude, in the thinner air, where the fuel consumption would be much smaller. So his purpose in 1931 was about fuel efficiency for air transport, protection of the environment. And he wrote a, an article in 1942 to promote solar energy. <laughs> and then my father made the deepest dive ever in the Marina Trench, 11 kilometers down. 1960, that was the time where governments wanted to drop the radioactive waste in the bottom of the oceans because they thought it was safe. So my father wanted to check if there was life down there. And there was life down there. There was a flat fish, several shrimps, and it shows that there are movement of oxygen from the surface where the oxygen is produced to the deepest trenches. There are currents, vertical currents. So if you throw something down there, it will mess up the entire ocean very, very quickly. So it was a milestone in the protection of the environment. And since then, it was prohibited to use the oceans as bin for the radioactive waste. So all these examples showed me that exploration must serve the quality of life of human beings. You need to explore new ways of doing, but you need to explore new ways of thinking. And actually, this is why I also became a psychiatrist and not just flying around the world with solar impulse or with a brightening orbiter three balloon. No, also in psychology, psychotherapy, hypnosis, to understand the way we can maybe think, in, think differently, improve our way of thinking, be more, let, let's say to put ourselves in an evolution instead of always staying prisoners of old patterns. We need to be able to change the paradigms and open ourselves to other ways of doing and thinking. This is why exploration for me is so important. This is also why I love to speak about exploration because everybody should be explorers. Everybody should explore. And we need more explorers, I would like to say, in the world of politics 
in the world of industry, in the world of institutions, of finance, of economy, we need more explorers. But exploration is scary. It can often be so scary. Do you ever get scared? I mean, as a, as a, as a pilot of these, on these great explorations, has that ever been scary for you? To be honest, I was not scared when I was flying my solar airplane, but I am scared every day on the ground when I see that our world is burning 1 million tons of oil every hour. This makes me really afraid, but not flying in a peaceful and clean and silent airplane. That, that's, that's an incredible accomplishment. We'll just wrap up here. I know we were talking, you know, this, this entire conversation is focused on COP26. We, we've talked about so many things we need to see accomplished at COP26. What, in your mind, as we look forward to the, the conference itself, will make this conference a success? I believe COP26 will be a success if the negotiators and the heads of states understand that it is in their own interest for the economy and the job creation of their country to take the measures that will protect the environment. This is something that can change the future, which means that it's maybe a paradox. If we speak too much of climate, we will create a lot of resistance for a lot of countries. If we speak a little bit more about the economical advantage for the country to become cleaner, to become more efficient, to, to use new business opportunities, then it will be much more successful because every country has this goal of develop the economy. And if they can develop the economy in a clean way, then, it, then it's a win-win and then the conference can be a success. But we should not reinforce the denial or the resistance of some countries. We need to take them with us and show them that there is a better way to do also for them. We need Dr. to be Car inclusive. Yeah, basically, we really need to be inclusive. I absolutely hope that gets accomplished at COP26. Dr. Picard, to be able to, the chance to be able to talk to one of our great explorers who's so knowledgeable and well-versed on the kind of sustainable solutions that we have available and we can use and that, that can fight this crisis. Uh, what an honor. This has been a, such a fun conversation. Thank you again for joining the Climate Pod. I was very happy to spend this hour with you and all your followers. Thank you for your great questions. It's a topic I love, and I spend a great time explaining this to you. And thank you for your interest, for your questions. Really great. I enjoyed it. Thank you so much.